Hi everyone! I think many of you have noticed how in recent years the electric vehicle market has been expanding rapidly. Scooters, bicycles and even some cars has become electrically powered. They have also acquired such massive batteries with lots of smaller lithium-ion cells. That's great, but what can you do when these accumulators degrade or lose most of their capacity? How will they be recycled and how many precious metals, lithium in particular, can be extracted from them? I guess I'll have to go to the laboratory and find out. If you have heard me talk about Brilliant before, then you know that it's a website and app built on the principle of active problem solving. Brilliant has recently upped the interactivity of their platform to a new level and they continue improving their courses to add more interactivity to them. Check out this lesson on the center of mass, for example. In this lesson, you are trying to balance mobiles. You can shift around the balance points and immediately see how the mobile balances. This is in Brilliant's newly updated scientific thinking course, which is full of interactive exercises that let you experience the principles of science firsthand. Brilliant has over 60 interactive courses in mathematics, computer and natural sciences. They are great if you'd like to study up on these disciplines for university or if you are just curious about how the world works. If you'd like to join me and the community of 8 million learners and educators today, click the link in the description down below or visit their website or visit brilliant.org slash toysoy2. The story of developing modern-day lithium-ion accumulators dates from the 1970s, when American scientists from Stanford University conducted their first experiments with lithium disulfide. And 20 years later, in 1991, thanks to the work of such scientists as John Goodenough, Stanley Whittingham and Akir Yoshina, Sony released its first commercial lithium-ion batteries. By the way, at last, in 2019, these three guys were awarded a Nobel Prize in chemistry for inventing lithium-ion batteries, which are still being widely used. Also, it's been 30 years since the first commercial lithium accumulators were released. Since then, their composition and shape have clearly undergone numerous changes. For this experiment, I'm going to use a lithium battery from an old angle grinder. I bought it a couple of years ago. It, as well as many other modern powerful devices, runs on the 9065-0 power banks, each with a capacity of 2600 mAh. After two years of active use, these accumulators have degraded, which means they have lost most of their capacity, which is why the angle grinder can work only 5 minutes on a single charge. That's why it's time to recycle this battery. To begin with, I'm taking apart the battery case and pulling out the very accumulator banks. It's not that simple, because each accumulator is soldered to the conductive nickel strip. That is why it's quite a time-consuming activity to dismantle such batteries without damaging anything. As far as I understand, this angle grinder battery was completely drained. However, as I was taking it apart, many power banks sparkled upon short circuiting, which seemed quite strange to me. Upon a more detailed inspection of each power bank with a multimeter, it turned out that they were charged almost to 60% of their capacity, and it was quite dangerous to take apart such accumulators for recycling. The creator of the Cryosan channel, for instance, confirmed this fact. If this cell with some charge in it gets damaged, it can easily short circuit and self-ignite. That's not something I want to see happen in front of my face when taking apart this accumulator. That is why for safety purposes, these banks need to be drained first. 
I decided to simply sandwich the first pack of parallel accumulators in between aluminum straps and then to short circuit them with the help of a nichrome wire acting as a resistor. Thus, energy from the power banks will be spent on heating the wire, which is why in 6 hours they are supposed to drain completely. Besides, I have read in one article that there is a simpler way of draining such accumulators, which is soaking them in 10% potassium carbonate solution. At the same time, the remaining energy from the accumulators will be used for electrolysis of the solution with the release of hydrogen and oxygen. The downside of the method is that it takes about 24 hours to completely drain all cells. But the upside is that during this process, potassium carbonate solution has a rather mild effect on the corrosion of cathode, and solution does not penetrate the power banks. Once the draining process has been completed, it's time to take apart the accumulator cases in order to take out the inner parts. I decided to do this with a regular pipe cutter. Fortunately, these battery cases are very thin and easy to cut. The upper lid section is easy to take off the case. However, because of the seaming, other parts of the batteries just wouldn't be pulled off. That is why I decided to saw through the steel case in order to finally reach the inner part of the accumulator. After removing the left hour parts of the case, we can see that the inner part is rolled into such a multi-layer sandwich with a polymer layer, which acts as a membrane. Basically, the design of such banks is not too complex. After peeling off, we can see that there are two strips inside. One seems to be made of copper and the other one is dark colored. The copper strip is an anode consisting of copper foil covered in a thin layer of graphite and basically it's useless for my experiments. We can just wrinkle it and melt it into a copper bar. But the dark one is the most valuable. This is a cathode made of aluminum foil covered in a layer of transition metal oxide mix. For instance, a mix of cobalt oxide with graphite particles and special adhesive and most importantly lithium oxide. As you may have guessed, these cells contain lithium oxide rather than metallic lithium. If you recall the school chemistry curriculum, you will remember that there is an ionic bond between oxygen and lithium in lithium oxide. This is why such accumulators are called lithium ion. However, I think to better explain the principle of their work, I have to show you an animation. Look, here is a rough diagram of such a lithium ion battery. There is a mix of different metal oxides, for instance cobalt and lithium oxides, which are placed on cathode aluminium foil, and there form areas with lithium ions between cobalt oxides. If we complement this diagram and add an anode made of copper foil and cover it in graphite, and add an electrolyte between the cathode and anode, then energized lithium ions will be able to travel to the graphite. These processes happen when the accumulator gets charged. Upon full charging, almost all lithium ions have stuck to the graphite, which acts as a frame for all lithium ions to stick to. If we connect such a charged accumulator to a load, for instance to an electrical motor, upon completing the circuit, lithium ions will be traveling back to their favorite spot, which is cobalt oxide, through the electrolyte thus producing electromotive force. Of course, this is a rather simplified explanation. Still, I think you'll understood how these accumulators work. It's time to continue recycling them. After separating one bank into a cathode and anode, we can do the same with the remaining accumulators. With a little bit of practice, I mastered this process and it went very smoothly. Of course, it's best to do this process wearing a respirator and gloves, because the oxide dust of different metals and toxic electrolyte dust can harm your health. It's 
In total, I have taken apart 10 such accumulators, and I have distributed the obtained material to three containers. I have filled the first container with copper foil and graphite. The second container is filled with plastic membranes and steel cases, and the third container is filled with the most valuable thing, that is cathode strips covered in lithium and cobalt oxides. It is with these containers content that I am going to run my experiments. The other containers, especially the second one, are filled with waste. Before recycling, first I place the purified cathodes under a fume hood for a couple of hours in order to vaporize the leftover electrolyte, which is commonly made of lithium fluoride compounds, for instance lithium tetrafluoroborate, such a solution as ethylene carbonate. It is due to having electrolytes in their composition that some lithium ion accumulators swell, because when volatile electrolytes are excessively heated, they can easily vaporize, and if we heat it to extreme, they can even self ignite. After drying the cathodes, first we need to separate that very black mix of oxide from the aluminium base, which is why I am filling the container with a regular drain cleaner, which is a 12% sodium hydroxide solution. The aluminium foil starts dissolving in sodium hydroxide, whereas the oxide mix doesn't react well with this chemical, that is why this black mass eventually sinks to the bottom. The reaction runs quite quickly. After that, I leave this mixture for another hour in order to dissolve the leftover foil in the alkali. Besides aluminium, the solution also contains an adhesive-like substance, which was used to stick the oxide mix to the foil, and also here are present some vestiges of graphite. In order to separate all of this, I am just pouring out the top layer of the liquid, and after that, I am rinsing it in water. Fortunately, the obtained oxides are heavier than water, and they easily sink to the bottom. After rinsing, we need to dissolve the obtained lithium and cobalt oxide mixture in sulfuric acid, which is why I am pouring water into the container, and then I start adding concentrated sulfuric acid until its concentration in the solution reaches about 25%. Stirring and heating to 80 degrees Celsius significantly speeds up the reaction. In order to speed up dissolving even further, I am adding several milliliters of concentrated hydrogen peroxide to the solution. Thus, cobalt and lithium oxides will be dissolved in the solution more easily. It took me about 2 hours to fully dissolve all of this. Now I am adding ammonia solution into our solution in order to remove the excess sulfuric acid which can make it harder for me to separate lithium from cobalt. After adding some ammonia, I test this solution with pH indicator, and as soon as it changed color from crimson to orange, we have reached the needed acidity of the solution. Now, the contents of my beaker is almost black, because of graphite vestiges in it. That is why I need to filter it properly, and this is exactly what I am doing using vacuum filtration. So, let us see what the color of the solution is after filtering. Hmm, that's strange. Instead of being red due to containing cobalt, it is actually dark green. Something is not right here. If we take a look at the sample solutions I have made, we can see that lithium compounds are colorless, whereas cobalt compounds are red. Seems like there are some impurities or some other metals in my solution as well. And if we look at solutions of other transition metals, at first sight only nickel and copper seems to match, so I need to consult the literature again to understand what my solution really contains. Having read several articles, I learned that lithium ion accumulators containing only lithium and cobalt oxides became outdated a long time ago and they were mainly used in old phones batteries until 2011, more modern and higher capacity accumulators use even more oxide mixtures, for instance such a complex compound made of cobalt, nickel, lithium and even manganese oxides. That is why it is going to be even harder than I supposed 
to separate this mix into a different constituent metal compounds. After a little bit of research, I found a more or less good manual of how to separate such a mixture of metals. This is a relatively recent article, that is why probably all metals listed in it are rather experimental. Another problem is that, before extracting lithium compounds from my solution, first I need to remove compounds of all other metals from it, and besides lithium, there turn out to be free of them. So let's get started. After dissolving cathodes, I suppose I have a mixture of nickel, cobalt, manganese and lithium sulfides in my solution in unknown ratio. Because of the fast development of lithium ion accumulators, different manufacturers apply oxides of these metals in different ratios. That is why I learned the exact ratios only at the end of the video. According to the instructions, first of all I need to extract manganese compounds from the solution, which is manganese sulfate. To do that, I am heating my solution using a magnetic stir. After that, I am adding such a concentrated solution as ammonium persulfate. This compound is used as a food additive, and it is a rather strong oxidizing agent, which turns manganese sulfide from the solution into insoluble manganese dioxide sediment. It takes about 2 hours for this dark compound to be fully deposited. After this process, all manganese dioxide is supposed to be removed from the solution. To separate it from the solution, I am filtering my solution using a vacuum filtration again. After that, I am evaluating the color of the obtained solution again. Most probably, after extracting all manganese compounds from the solution, nickel compounds are the dominant compounds in this beaker, because the color is vibrant green. I think there is very little of the precious red cobalt. Looking at the compositions of modern cathodes for lithium ion accumulators, it becomes clear that most probably I have got either the newest ones or the previous models, where most of the expensive cobalt oxide is substituted with cheaper nickel and manganese. Thus, such batteries are cheaper to manufacture and have higher capacity. That is why, in order to separate the remaining nickel and cobalt from the precious lithium in my solution, I am just pouring concentrated sodium hydroxide solution into my beaker. As a result, a nickel and cobalt hydroxide sediment of such light green color sinks to the bottom. If needed, later nickel and cobalt can be separated from each other. But now, my main focus of interest is extracting lithium from the solution, rather than side metal compounds. The only problem with this greenish sediment was that it was too fine, and when filtered with a suction filter, it would turn into something like clay which made the whole process last forever. Eventually, in order not to burn my vacuum pump, I filtered only half of the solution. I think it's enough for extracting lithium. In the end, I got a transparent liquid, containing a mix of sodium sulfate, ammonium sulfate and lithium sulfate, which I need to separate again and extract lithium compounds from this solution. Fortunately, it's very easy to do. I just need to heat the solution almost to boiling temperature and add concentrated sodium carbonate solution to it. At the same time, there starts forming poorly soluble lithium carbonate, which quite quickly sinks to the bottom. It's noteworthy that in contrast with many other salts, solubility of lithium carbonate decreases as the temperature increases. That is why, while the solution is still hot, I am filtering it again, separating the precious lithium carbonate from the byproducts. Eventually, after drying and rinsing, I have got 7.6 grams of pure lithium carbonate from 10 batteries. However, its concentration in 10 such batteries is supposed to be 4 times higher. That is why either the extraction methods from the articles were not too optimistic or I lost some precious lithium while rinsing and filtering. One thing is certain, all these hydrometallurgical methods of recycling lithium ion accumulators are far from being perfect and are not exactly suitable for mass production. This is why now many companies simply burn and melt such batteries 
and after that they sell the obtained alloy for other purposes. And I don't even know how things will change in 10 years when most electrical cars and scooters being used now end up at the landfills. Maybe by then more efficient recycling methods will have been invented and lithium compounds deficit won't be a problem. So I think after reviewing that video you'll know how much lithium in these lithium ion batteries is really is and how today modern technologies are helping us to recycle them. And if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel to see many more new and interesting.